we gather in a rather different way to uh, focus on our Lenten service this evening because of the restrictions placed by the state on assemblies of more than 10 people. Pray that you will be blessed by our time together as we <clears throat> participate in this way. Let us begin with a word of prayer. Father, we uh, perhaps never dreamt of meeting as a congregation in this way, but Lord, we come with faith in our hearts, guided by your Holy Spirit, and ask that you would minister to us you know, through this rather unique setting, this unique way of coming together in Jesus' name. And so bless this service to your honor and glory as we commit it to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us pray the words of this uh, song as we begin. Open our eyes, Lord. We want to see Jesus, to reach out and touch him, and say that we love him. Open our ears, Lord, and help us to listen. Open our eyes, Lord. We want to see Jesus. Open my eyes, Lord. I want to see Jesus, to reach out and touch him, and say that I love him. Open my ears, Lord, and help me to listen. Open my eyes, Lord. I want to see Jesus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord is in his holy temple. His throne is in heaven. The Lord is near to all who are of humble and contrite spirit. He hears the requests of the penitent and listens to their prayers. Let us therefore draw near with boldness to his throne of grace and confess our sins. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Heavenly Father, we come before you to seek your mercy and grace. We have sinned against you and, our, and against ourselves with our wrong attitudes of selfishness and pride. We have not followed completely what you have told us in your word, and have at times even rebelled against your ways. We are sorry. We seek your forgiveness and cleansing through your Son, Jesus Christ, to whom all praise and glory will be given. In his name, amen. In lieu of singing the words of our hymns this evening, I will read them, and you are free to read them as well. Sometimes I think reading the words of a song help us to capture the, the message in a much greater way. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for sinners such as I? Was it for crimes that I had done? He groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. Well might the sun in darkness hide and shut his glories in, when God the mighty maker died for man the creature's sin. Thus might I hide my blushing face while his dear cross appears, dissolve my heart in thankfulness and melt my eyes to tears. But drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away. Tis all that I can do. And we give ourselves away in, in faith to our triune God and to Jesus as our Savior. And we'd like to confess that faith now in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and is seated on the right hand of the Father, 
and he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The scripture lesson for this evening is from Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. <clears throat> we died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. We read again the words of a hymn, this hymn, What Wondrous Love Is This? What wondrous love is this, O my soul, O my soul? What wondrous love is this, O my soul? What wondrous love is this that caused the Lord of bliss to bear the dread dreadful curse for my soul, for my soul? To bear the dreadful curse for my soul. When I was sinking down, sinking down, sinking down when i was sinking down sinking down when i was sinking down beneath god's righteous frown christ laid aside his crown for my soul for my soul christ laid aside his crown for my soul to god and to the lamb i will sing i will sing to god and to the lamb i will sing to god and to the lamb who is the great i am while millions join the throng, theme, I will sing, I will sing. While millions join the theme, I will sing. And when from death I'm free, I'll sing on, I'll sing on. And when from death I'm free, I'll sing on, I'll sing on. And when from death I'm free, I'll sing his love for me. And through eternity, I'll sing on, I'll sing on. And through eternity, I'll sing on. <clears throat> the hymn writer asks a question about the wondrous love of our Lord Jesus. And we are focusing this Lenten season on the nails of the cross. And for our text this evening, we'd like to turn to John chapter 8 and read verses 31 through 44. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slave to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you seek to kill me, because my word has no place in you. I speak the things which I have seen with my father. Therefore you also do the things which you heard from your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, If you are Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. 
but that as it is you are seeking to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. This Abraham did not do. You are doing the deeds of your father. They said to him, We were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and have come from God, for I have not even come on my own initiative, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I am saying? It is because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. As we think of these words this evening under the theme, the nail of the cross, we'd like to focus specifically on the nail of misdirected faith. <clears throat> As we see in the opening verses, Jesus spoke to the people, and we read that many came to believe in him. So when Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. Jesus is speaking of the Jews who had believed him. That phrase indicates that some paid attention to Jesus' words without necessarily committing themselves to him in a true saving faith. Jesus seems to be implying that it was possible to believe in him in some way without being a true disciple of his. <clears throat> they had what we might call that misdirected faith. I think of other times in the scriptures where that is so true. In John 6, Jesus was speaking to the people, and then we read when many of his disciples, and it's not talking about the 12 disciples here, but other followers, when they heard this, they said, this is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? And then later, as a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. There were those who had put a certain degree of faith in Jesus, but pretty soon they turned and left. And it was at that time that Jesus said to his 12 disciples, you do not want to go away too, do you? And Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have words of eternal life. And we have believed and come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus responded to them by pointing out that there was yet one among those twelve that Peter was, Peter was speaking on behalf of that had a misdirected faith, and that was Judas, who, when all was said and done, betrayed Jesus to those who would eventually put him to death on the cross. Is it possible for us to have a misdirected faith as well, as we see the examples of the people in our text or other disciples who turned and walked away from Jesus? or Judas, who even went to the point of betraying him. <clears throat> we want to consider some thoughts about that misdirected faith in our text this evening. First of all, realizing that uh, continuing in the truth is a sign of a true follower and learner or disciple of Jesus. If they really grasped his message, they would find salvation and truth, and knowing this salvation truth would liberate them from their bondage and sin. We could say Jesus was wanting them to progress from having a misdirected faith to having a faith that truly believes in him as Savior. And, and so the points of our uh, text this evening, first of all, misdirected faith is a result of a wrong understanding of truth. A misdirected faith does not know the truth. And Jesus implied that when he said, if you continue in my word, you will know the truth. He uh, has said that they weren't in his word. Even though John records them as those who believed, Jesus points out several aspects of the fact that their faith was misdirected. It was a wrong kind of faith. It was putting faith in Jesus for the wrong reason or whatever. <clears throat> Think of those who, because of a lack of truth, praised Jesus on Palm Sunday and 
just a few days later cried out crucify him crucify him Jesus spoke to those who were supposed followers or believers of him and he said I know you are not you are Abraham's descendants yet you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you it doesn't seem possible that they would be true believers in Jesus as the Savior the Messiah if their desire was to kill him and Jesus said the reason they wanted to do away with him was because his word had no place in them a misdirected faith does not know the truth but we see something I think even more serious here and that is that a misdirected faith cannot know the truth notice what Jesus says about these people why is it that you do not understand what I'm saying it's because you cannot hear my word why could they not hear Jesus word and then these strong words you are of your father the devil he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him whenever he speaks a lie he speaks from his own nature for he is a liar and the father <clears throat> of all lies rewind history back to the Garden of Eden when our first parents encountered Satan and all of his lies and his ability to persuade led them to believe the lie rather than the truth and mankind was plunged into sin to ruin destruction the curse and <clears throat> really all mankind became children of our enemy the devil Jesus said to those people you are of your father the devil you want to do his desires that's why they could not know the truth 2nd Corinthians 4 tells us that the God of this world a reference to Satan has blinded the eyes of the unbelieving so that they cannot see come to an understanding of the glorious gospel of our Lord Jesus a misdirected faith cannot know the truth because it is blinded in the eyes of the enemy <clears throat> Satan and so misdirected faith is first of all a result of a wrong understanding of truth does not know the truth and cannot know the truth then secondly misdirected faith is a result of a wrong understanding of sin Jesus deals with that at length here as well a misdirected faith does not understand sins origin and we again hear those strong words that Jesus spoke to these people you do the things which you heard from your father how many of us do that our, our father's influence is a great thing as well we are growing up but again here it's not talking about the biological earthly fathers talking about Satan you are doing the deeds of your father you are of your father the devil and you want to do the desires of your father that's the origin of sin and its effect upon lost mankind we live out the desires of Satan which is nothing but wickedness and evil that is his purpose for us and sin's origin is in Satan himself in his deceptive words that brought Adam and Eve into that disobedience that is why David prayed these words behold I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me we are sinful from birth we are sinful from the very time of conception in our mother's womb we have inherited that sin nature from our mother and father all the way back to Adam and Eve <coughs> excuse me misdirected faith doesn't grasp the seriousness of that the, the seriousness of sins origin the consequence is that the heart is more deceitful than all else and desperately sick 
who can understand it? We might say it was spiritually sick. Misdirected faith is a result of a wrong understanding of sin, specifically sin's origin, but also Jesus deals with this, does not understand sin's power. Jesus tells these people, I tell you the truth, everyone who lives in sin is a slave to sin. That's a modern translation. Uh, other translations say everyone who commits sin. Uh, the emphasis on that word commit is lives in sin. It's a, a practice. It doesn't mean that if I have a, a sinful thought, all of a sudden I'm a slave to sin. Believers sin, but we're not enslaved in sin. Uh, but a misdirected faith does not understand that that's really the case. Sin's power has a hold on them. I think of people today who are living lives of sin with no concern whatsoever. Things that were taboo a couple of generations ago are practiced freely with no concern whatsoever. We think of people who are murderers, thieves, that just continue to sin in those ways over and over. People whose hearts are filled with hatred and anger for fellow human beings. Those who live in sin are a slave to sin. And these words from the prophet Jeremiah. <clears throat> in Jeremiah chapter 6. Show the enslavement of the people in sin at that time. Were they ashamed because of the abomination they have done? They were not ashamed at all. They did not even know how to blush. Misdirected faith lives in sin thinking that they are free. Free as a bird. But the truth is they are enslaved. Paul says, don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey? Whether you are slaves to sin which leads to death or to obedience which leads to righteousness slaves to the one whom you obey Peter says the same thing a man is a slave to whatever has mastered him a misdirected faith does not understand sin's power the people Jesus was talking to couldn't understand that they were enslaved in sin now these were highly religious people but yet they were trying to kill Jesus. They wanted nothing to do with him. They, his word had no place in them. They were mastered by sin, which led them to the rejection of Jesus. They had a misdirected faith because they had a wrong understanding of sin. And that leads to the third point, misdirected faith is a result of wrong understanding of Jesus. A misdirected faith has an imperfect knowledge of Jesus, first of all. Remember what Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him. You are seeking to kill me, a man who has told you the truth which I heard from God. They had heard the truth. They rejected it. They believed in him to a certain degree but yet they were seeking to kill him they had heard the truth but they didn't accept all the truth which would lead to a, a true knowledge of Jesus and who he was and why he came but they wanted to do away with him because of their imperfect knowledge of who he really was I think of times when Jesus addressed this knowledge of himself. Sometimes it was imperfect knowledge. Sometimes it was accurate knowledge. I think of Matthew 16 when he asked the disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? They said, some say John the Baptist and others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Noble answers. 
but they're wrong. That's an imperfect knowledge of Jesus. They had a misdirected faith. But then Jesus said to the disciples, Who do you say that I am? And Peter answers on behalf of the twelve, You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. They had a, a accurate knowledge of Jesus, <clears throat> which would lead to a, a proper faith, a saving faith in him. But then Jesus makes a strange statement. He warned his disciples that they should tell no one that he was the Christ. Why? Uh, I thought that was the followers of Jesus' mission, was to spread the word, to let people know. Well, Jesus, I believe, was concerned that people with a misdirected faith would also have that misdirected faith further complicated because there was such a, a wide array of misunderstandings of who the Messiah was supposed to be. It might be confusing. It might further solidify them in their misdirected faith. I think is why Jesus made this statement at this point in time. Then Jesus went on there in Matthew 16 to tell the disciples that he had to go to Jerusalem, be crucified, and, and so forth. And then Peter rebuked him and said, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You're not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. The same Peter who for the twelve, on behalf of the twelve, confessed that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God, all of a sudden is showing some signs, too, of misdirected faith here. He's struggling with this full knowledge of Jesus, which involved death on the cross and we know how critical that was to our salvation knowledge of who Jesus is as he has revealed himself in his word is critical to our faith misdirected faith has an imperfect knowledge of who Jesus is an imperfect knowledge maybe there is a limited knowledge there are many people today who believe he was a historical figure who walked on this earth. <clears throat> That's true. Many people, people believe he was a great moral example. That's true. Many believed he was a good teacher. That's true. And the list could go on and on. But our knowledge of Jesus needs to include the fact that he came to be the savior of mankind it needs to include the fact that he gave his life on Calvary's cross for our sins. And many of the truths we believe about Jesus, we confess them in the Nicene Creed this evening. Many of these things are so important. About 15 years ago, a sociologist by the name of Christian Smith studied the faith of Christian teenagers. He studied their beliefs. He studied their knowledge of Jesus. And he came to the conclusion that Christian teenagers in the year 2005 believed in what he called moralistic therapeutic deism. I've shared this before, but again, a brief def definition. First of all, the moralistic part is those teenagers believe God wanted them to live a good life, to be good people. The therapeutic side of that belief believed that God wanted them to feel good about themselves. Then the deism part of that belief, um, deism is a belief that God created the world and everything in it, and then he sat back in his easy chair and put up his feet and really doesn't have anything to do with it it anymore. Uh, those uh, who participated or were labeled as moralistic therapeutic deism had a belief that God exists, he doesn't bother us too much, and he doesn't expect us to be too committed, but he is there if we need to ask for help. 
That's a misdirected faith because of an imperfect knowledge of who Jesus is. Every one of those three words has a certain element of truth to it, but it is an incomplete, imperfect knowledge of who our Savior is. But we want to consider that a misdirected faith can, can come to a saving knowledge of Jesus. That's the other side of the nail of the cross. Each week as we look at these different nails of the cross, there's the, the, the nail of my sin that caused Jesus to go there. But that nail ultimately achieved victory over that sin. We have to keep that in mind as well. Understand the law and the gospel of these nails and of the nail of misdirected faith. A misdirected faith can come to a saving knowledge of Jesus. It can come to a saving knowledge of Jesus through his word. If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. The Word of God is essential to having a saving knowledge of Jesus. <clears throat> the Word of God is that which God has given us to reveal Himself, to reveal His Son to us so that we can know Him. <clears throat> when we are seeking to get to know a person, we spend time with them. We want to know who they are. We ask questions and so forth. We get to know Jesus through his word. We get to understand him through the, the pages of scripture that have been revealed to us. Misdirected faith can come to a saving knowledge of Jesus through his word. A misdirected faith can also come to a saving knowledge of Jesus through birth from above. Jesus said to these Jews, if God were your father, you would love me. If that was the case, he told them the devil was their father. But if God were your father, how could that come to be? Jesus says in John 6 that no one can come to him unless the father has enabled him. It takes a, a being born from above. Jesus told Nicodemus, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again, born from above. The Father provides that. In John 1, we read, to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And then John clarifies this, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. Born from above a spiritual rebirth from the Father in heaven. And so, really, a misdirected faith can come to a saving knowledge of Jesus through the nail of misdirected faith. It's not just, that nail does not just represent our sin. It represents Jesus' victory over our sin. And that is why Paul said to the church in Corinth, I was determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. The message of Christ on the cross, the nails of the cross, was the, the solution to our sin, the way to have victory. Paul further spoke to the Corinthians, I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and which also you stand, by which also you are saved. If you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. The Apostle Paul declaring the significance of the cross, the significance of those nails of the cross, for our redemption, for our salvation. A misdirected faith can come to a saving knowledge of Jesus because of that nail of the cross. As we reflect again upon Jesus' words to these Jews, he spoke to those who professed to have believed in him. 
But yet we realize that these same Jews were seeking to kill him. They were instruments, really, of their father, the devil. But we have seen how the nail of misdirected faith can give us the victory over such wrong belief, over such wrong understanding who Jesus is. Misdirected faith is a result of a wrong understanding of truth. Misdirected faith doesn't know the truth, and it cannot know the truth because of the, the stronghold that Satan has upon those people's lives. He's their father. He has filled them with his own sinful desires, his own rejection of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Misdirected faith is secondly a result of the wrong understanding of sin. Satan wants us to love sin, to live in sin, to practice sin as a habitual part of our lives. We need to understand sin's origin. It's from the devil himself. Because of that, we need to understand sin's power. Those who live in sin habitually are slaves of sin, not freedom. To live a life of freedom is not, not what it is to follow our Savior. It's a life of slavery. And thirdly, misdirected faith is a result of wrong understanding of Jesus. We need to be in his word that we can overcome that imperfect knowledge of who he is, those imperfect beliefs, those deficient beliefs, and know him truly for who he has revealed himself in his word. And that will give us victory. We can come to a saving knowledge of our Lord Jesus as we seek him in his word, as we seek to know and to understand him through that word. We will know the truth we will continue in his word as true disciples of his and know the truth, and the truth will set us free. Father in heaven, we thank you again for the victory we have in Jesus and the cross of Calvary. And we ask that you would look into our hearts now and by your spirit and through your word reveal to us any deficient ideas we have of our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to know him, to know him fully, to know him more day after day, and to have a true saving faith in him. Not a faith that's misdirected and therefore deficient for salvation, but a faith that trusts him because we have surrendered our lives to him, trusting for forgiveness, life, and salvation. For we ask this in his precious name. Amen. In closing, I will read the words of our closing hymn again tonight, Wide open are thy hands. Wide open are thy hands, pain with more than gold, the awful debt of guilty men forever and of old. Ah, let me grasp those hands that we may never part. Let the power of their blood sustain my fainting heart. Wide open are thine arms, a fallen world to embrace, to take to love and endless rest our whole forsaken race. Lord, I am sad and poor, but boundless is thy grace. Give me the soul-transforming joy for which I seek thy face. Draw all my mind and heart up to thy throne on high. And let thy sacred cross exalt my spirit to the sky. To these thy mighty hand, my spirit I resign. Living, I live alone to thee, and dying, I am thine. Thank you for joining us for this uh, unique type of service. Continue to pray for our nation and for our world in the light of this coronavirus. And we ask that God will bless us and bless his truth to our hearts as we Dismiss this evening with the words, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.